Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiner, and welcome to season six of Are You Listening? Today, I'm going to walk you through mastering a pop track. This track is by an artist named Braden the Young, and it's called Give It Time. When I think about digging into a, a track that lives in a genre, I want to understand what the genre offers in terms of expectations, customary references. I might sort of mine my catalog of, of stuff that seems relevant to the track. I don't want to get too caught up in the idea of references. Of course, I also want to understand what the particular track has to offer and what the artist is trying to express and what the emotional ambience of a track is. Pop is kind of a, a tricky genre. There are so many versions of track. At the root, I guess it really refers to the popular music of the day. But even there, there can be pop music that's singer-songwriter focused and pop music that's informed more by rock or crossover or subgenres and so on. But there are some things to be said about level and overall tone and particularly the way the bass is structured. So when I dive into the track, I'm going to sort of talk through some of the things that I'm hearing, develop some goals for where I want to end up with the track, and then hopefully get there. Before I dive into actually mastering the track, the first thing I'm going to do is pull the file into Isotope RX. There are a bunch of different tools that will offer the insights that I'm going to get from RX. But the thing I'm really interested in is this waveform stats window that you see right here. That's going to tell me several things about the track. First of all, I can see the sample rate. This is a 48K file. Usually I like to work at the sample rate of the mix natively. Very, very rarely will I upsample to 88.2 or 96. Otherwise, I'll work at the native sample rate. But I also have to file away the information that at the end of the process, I'm probably going to need to do a sample rate conversion to get it into the format that's going to work for the artist to send it off to aggregators for streaming services, et cetera. So looking at this waveform stats window, there's some interesting things that we can take away. First of all, the peak level, whether it's true peak or sample peak, I've got plenty of headroom. That's good news. If you're mixing and then going to send something to mastering or going to master a track, if you leave no headroom, note to self, chances are you're going to have to turn the track down to work on it and then try to bring the track back up. That's challenging on a number of levels. It's kind of psychologically challenging to turn something down when at the end of the day, you probably want something to sound clearer and more present. But also, if you've engaged a limiter in the mix process, you might end up with some noticeable artifacts especially in the high end with a limiter that will be revealed even more during the context of or in the process of mastering. So it's great to have this headroom. The RMS level, it's at minus 19, and that's average throughout the entire track. And the integrated LUFS level is minus 20. What that says to me is that this is kind of a bass-heavy track. If you remember from a previous episode of Are You Listening, integrated LUFS winds in a little bit about our sensitivity to sound in different parts of the spectrum. We're less sensitive to low end. The overall measurement here is pointing to the fact that there's a fair bit of low end, and so this measurement is actually lower than the LUFS. Not really something to be concerned about when we hear the track. It will validate, I think, what I just said. So mostly this is all good news. I'm going to go ahead and put RX away, and now move over to my mastering environment du jour. Why don't we give the track a little bit of a listen? I'll play, oh, maybe the first couple of minutes of the track so we can hear it. Give it time, give it time, give it 
I always hate hitting the space bar. I'm just going to do a sort of a fade here before I hit stop on the track. Anyway, it's a cool track. There are things that are really lovely and charismatic and fun and interesting and vibey about it. When I start working on a track, one of the things I'm paying attention to is what I enjoy. It may seem kind of like stating the obvious, but if at the end of the day, I've gone after all kinds of conceptual, heady, abstracted ideas to make a track sound different, but I've lost the vibe and I've lost the feeling and the, the coolness of a track, that's not good. I'll sort of take mental notes. I might even write down some notes at the beginning of a track to notice what I like. And I can refer back to them so that when I'm in the heat of the battle, I can look back and say, oh, right, I really dug the way the low end was working and now I'm not liking it so much. And then it'll cause me to sort of rewind and, and think a little bit harder or revisit some of the decisions that I'm making. So after listening to the track, there are a few things that leap out at me. First thing to notice is there are these two sections, these two scenes, if you will, verses uh, that don't have the low end and don't have the beat going seem pretty good. It doesn't really strike me as it needs a ton of work when it gets into the scene with the bass and the hi-hat and the, the section where the vocals kind of sit back a little bit in the track. It feels like the mid-range and where the vocal sits takes a step back and the bass kind of folds up and over the vocal. And the hi-hat, which is a cool you know, glitchy almost kind of sound that sketches the edges of the stereo image and also provides that sort of sizzly excitement in the track is great, but it's pretty hot. And when I'm thinking about translation, if you have something that's that bright and that hot coming out of a tiny little speaker, it might sound a little bit annoying and kind of dominate the overall soundstage. So those are the things that I'm picking up with my ears. However, we have tools that can help us validate what we hear. So you've heard the phrase, lead with your ears and use your eyes to validate. Actually, what some people say is use your ears, not your eyes. I like to use my eyes to validate what I hear. Um, I'm all about visualizations. But again, we're, we're looking to make sure that what we think we're hearing is in fact true. So I'm going to go ahead and hit play on the big section and compare it against the tonal balance control environment just to see what it tells me. And I'm going to use the bass heavy genre. I could pull up the pop genre. Actually, maybe I'll switch while I'm playing this section and let's see what we see. So indeed, I switched between three genres because it seems like this track is kind of living in between all of them, hip hop, pop, and the bass heavy genre. And we saw some differences in where the low end sits in the three genres. The high end is a little bit more consistent between them. And consistently, we saw that the top end was a little bit overcooked according to the tonal balance control spectrum. You know, this is just a, an offering of perspective, but in this case, I already made some observations, and then this is validating the observations. So I'm thinking that uh, that maybe I'm headed uh, down the right road if I think about trying to sort of mellow out the top a little bit and maybe shape the bottom. It seems like the, there's a lump in the low end around 50 hertz or so that just feels like it's a little overly heavy and a little overly active. Thinking musically about this track, the things that are interesting, you know, we have the vocals, which are the obvious sort of protagonist, um, the bass and that moving bass line feels like a character in the song. So I don't want to lose the, the bass. I don't want to roll off so much bass that we no longer have that foil for the vocal. Clearly, I don't want to lose the hi-hat. I don't think we're in any danger of that. But there are also some interesting 
other little sounds uh, that are playing important roles in the arrangement, like the guitar, which has delays. There's some background vocals and some delay throws that I want to make sure not only to not lose, but I wouldn't mind hearing a little bit more of them. Some of those inner voices are really kind of cool and help create the sense of the vibe of the track. Again, I'm developing ideas, I'm developing goals before I've even done anything. So now that I've sketched out some notions about what I might want to do with the track, the next thing to do is to think about level. Obviously, mastering isn't all about level. It's not all about loudness. However, you can be pretty sure that if you're mastering a pop track, you're going to need the level to be within a certain range in order to kind of meet the, the common practices of the market and satisfy the artist. So I'm going to pull up a limiter and pull down the threshold and get the level at the output of ozone to approximately where I think it should be. I'm not going to use the limiter to get all of the loudness that I need, but I want to understand a little bit of what's going to happen when I increase the level of the track. So let me hit play. In the case of this track for the loud sections, and this is just based on my experience in mastering in various genres, I'm going to expect to see an RMS level that's somewhere around minus 10, uh, minus 8. Minus 10 is probably a little bit conservative, but it'll be a good starting point. So you can see the RMS is rising and falling right around a center point of minus 10. I look over at my threshold, 8 dB down, which means 8 dB of makeup gain, and I've turned down the ceiling by minus 1. Note to self, note to all of you, um, when you produce final masters, it's always good to leave a little margin at the top of the dynamic range to allow for making MP3s. It's outside the scope of what we're going to talk about today, but the, the common practice is to leave a little bit of a margin at the top. What's interesting is that when I pull the limiter down and get the level in the ballpark, the sound changes. The hi-hat is really interacting a lot with the limiter, which kind of makes sense because it's pretty strong in the overall balance of the spectrum. And the kick drum is actually getting a, li a little bit flattened out and getting kind of splatty in the track. The reason that I will use this as a first gesture is it starts to define some of the work. If in getting the level to where I want it to get, I, I see some unpleasant interactions with a limiter, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to have to deal with the low end and the high end a little bit, which again kind of validates the insights that I was seeing from tonal balance control. So now the question is how to approach the challenges of this track. In the ozone environment, there is this thing called the master assistant. It has the potential to give you some insights and yield some possible treatments that you can use. And if you're not sure really where to start, you can certainly use it. Let's see what happens if I run the assistant. And again, I'm going to run it on the hottest part of the track. It says it's waiting for audio, so let me give it some audio. So clearly it's done a lot. When I came out of bypass, it got a lot louder, right? If we take a look at some of the settings, it's actually suggesting a threshold of minus 11, which is a little bit more aggressive than where I was. If you're happy with what you get coming out of the assistant, you're good to go. In general, I like to finesse the work a little bit more myself. But the thing that I'm most interested in is taking a look at what the equalizer is offering. And it's referring to genre targets. I can scroll through some of the different genre targets here. So I could change from pop to hip hop and rap or folk. Gee, if this was a folk record, it's suggesting I give it a lot of mid range because folk music doesn't have very, very low bass. This is definitely not a folk record. Let's point it at the pop. There we go. It's still pointing at a couple of things. First of all, we're suggesting more mid-range presence as opposed to the low end and the high end, which again kind of goes hand in hand with the thing that I was talking about earlier. 
It's also suggesting adding a little bit of sizzle, a little bit, actually maybe more than a little bit of sizzle in the top end. If you like the general sense of direction that this is pointing you at, you can go ahead and use it and modify it. You can change the percentage multiplier slider to increase or decrease the amount of EQ or the intensity of the EQ treatment. And you can certainly always go in and and change it. Again, I'm interested in looking at this from the standpoint of generating some ideas. It's kind of like a customized preset or a starting point for a track. One more interesting thing that you can use this environment for is capture the spectrum from a particular reference that you're interested in using a tool like Audio Lens. And you can see here that I've got a list of possible reference tracks populating the list here on the left. And I could compare this track, for instance, to a song called Partition by Beyonce, which has a ton of low end. It's sort of an interesting reference. And now it gives me a whole different idea in terms of the curve. In fact, take a look. It's saying, if you want it to sound like Partition, you need a lot less top end, a lot more mid range, and even a little bit more way, way down low. I know for a fact that this low frequency boost won't work for this track because Partition has a scrolling sine wave that goes all the way down to 30 hertz or practically down to DC in the center of the earth. This track doesn't have that same bass component, but it's an interesting point of comparison. Everything I've looked at so far is consistent with the things that I was hearing in the track. So once again, it's kind of helpful and validating to see this. But you can use your custom targets uh, from individual references. You can see that there are a few recognizable tracks here. Kendrick's Mr. Morale record. Again, very different, a lot more mid-range still, much less low end. So here again is where, if I lean back into the idea of what are references good for, they're good for general, helpful guidelines creating some interesting ideas for where you might take a track, but you don't want to follow references too literally because uh, your track is going to be different from the reference, at least in some meaningful ways. So now I'm going to start working on the track. I'm going to put on my trusty headphones. I am not in my preferred mastering environment. And so I need to be able to have a point of reference while I'm demonstrating that uh, I can be reassured that what I'm hearing is something with which I am familiar in terms of tone. So I'm going to put my cans on and we'll be here together this way. The first thing I'm gonna do is start by adjusting tone. If I start doing anything with compression or other kinds of assertive kinds of signal processing, and I'm dealing with something that's not in a good sort of balanced starting point, chances are I will start making mistakes or wander down a road that I'm gonna regret later. So the place for me to start with is tone, and the low end and the top end are the obvious things to deal with. So the first thing I'm gonna do is see if I can get the low end to sit in slightly better proportion. Remember, I don't want to lose the bass. I don't want to lose the fullness and the richness. I don't want to lose the support from the vocal. And I most certainly don't want to affect the tone of the voice. Let me see if I can just tilt the low end down a little bit and, and get it to sit in better proportion to the rest of the track. So that seems pretty good. I've noticed that the richness of the low end is kind of in a better spot, but it's changed the tone of the kick drum a little bit and it's made the knocky part of the mid part of the kick drum a little bit strong. So I might need to find a specific area to pull down a little bit so that the kick sits with the bass in kind of the same way that it did in the mix. All right, so let me play it before and after. Every time I make an EQ move, I'm always A-being. Going again back to the idea of making sure that I'm serving the original mix and the feeling. If I listen to the before and after, and the after sounds better or is moving in the right direction without changing things too much or losing the things that I'm enjoying, then I'm happy and I'll move on to the next task. If I seem to be hurting something, then I'll rethink my decisions. <laughs> That's pretty good. There's a little color change in the voice, but it's not 
bad. There's a way in which the vocal's a little bit woolen. I don't want it to stand out too much from the rest of the track, but I'm actually liking the way the, the vocal feels a little freer and a little clearer. So I'm going to go with that and now move over and start working on the top end as well. So there are a few areas in the top end where I'm hearing that um, kind of glassy percussive sound and the hi-hat. I don't think I necessarily want to roll off a lot of top end. I don't want to lose some of the detail in the air. In fact, later, you know, I may want to do something to make sure that I'm enhancing the, <sighs> the breathiness of the track overall. So I'm going to go for some narrower band filters to see if I can notch out the top end a little bit and get it to be in better proportion to the rest of the track. While you're watching this, if you want to get a sense of the differences that I'm making, put on headphones. Unless you have a great playback environment, don't listen through your phone or your laptop speakers and expect to hear the nuance and the subtlety of all the differences. So that seems pretty good. I haven't hurt the tone too much. I pulled out some areas that felt a little bit pokey and piercing and annoying to me. I noticed I was losing a little bit of that breathiness I was referring to. So I pulled up a very gentle high frequency shelf called a Baxendall and just added a dB on the top and it seemed to bring back the breathiness and that sort of cool vibey sound in the voice. So now I'm gonna step back and do a quick AB again, paying attention to the overall sound rather than dialing in specifically to these individual EQ points. It's really easy to get into the get lost in the weeds and lose track of the sort of the general impression that you're making. Now I'm going to go back over to my limiter and turn it back on and make sure I'm listening through the limiter because it's going to change things a little bit. Before I commit to a lot of the direction and the specific changes that I'm making, I need to be listening at the level of the destination or the target of the track. I'm going to turn on the gain match so I can bypass with and without the limiter and listen. I tend to prefer the mode where when you go into bypass, it boosts the input level so it matches the target output level. That way I'm listening at the level that my master will end up at. Give it time, give it time, baby, something different will happen. She said, give it time, give it time, baby, things won't I think I'm hearing a little quick pumping. There's something I'm not loving about the way I have it set up right now. I have it in the IRC3 mode, which is generally pretty transparent. Um, and it's usually the limiter that I'll use as my final, final stage limiter. But I'd like something that's a little bit smoother to be doing some of the dynamic range control. So I'm gonna pull up the vintage limiter, set it before the uh, IRC3 limiter, and see if I can share the work between these two tools. So I'm gonna pull the IRC3 limiter up to minus three, see if I can get about five of those dB back from the vintage limiter. And this should give me a slightly smoother response, um, which I think will help keep the vocals in the perspective where I want them to be. Yeah. 
I'm using the tube setting. It's got a very, very, very long release time. It's almost two seconds, which is um, consistent with the technology that was measured and modeled to design the ballistics of this limiter. Because it's that long, I know I can only really tickle the, the threshold. I don't want to get too deep into it. So I'm going to increase the release time or decrease the release time, make it a little bit faster in the IS-33. I'm definitely liking that tone a lot better. Limiters are supposed to be transparent. In reality, there's no such thing as a transparent limiter. The minute you start changing the relationship between peak and average and imposing some kind of attack and release time, it's going to change the sound of the signal. So I'm pretty happy with this combination of tools. Now, at the beginning, when I listened to this track, one of the things that, that occurred to me was that the transition from the verse to the chorus, it didn't seem quite right. It seemed like the gain staging of the tune overall wasn't what I wanted it to be. Well, it's better now with the tonal change that I've made. I'd like to tweak the relationship between the verse and the chorus so when the chorus happens, it feels like it's a slight step forward in terms of overall level, and the vocal level holds its own going from the verse to the chorus. Again, we, we don't want to change the feel too much between the tracks, so I'm going to actually split this track into two right when the beat drops. There we go. And just out of curiosity, I'm going to turn the EQ off in the first verse, because as I said before, I thought the verse sounded pretty good. You know, there is kind of a, a credo in mastering, which is do no harm. If you don't need to do something, don't do it. So let's see what happens if we go from no EQ to the treatment in the chorus. You tell me that it's all been in my head. Give it time, give it time, baby. It's pretty good, but I think that this section can come down just a touch. So in this environment, I'm working in WaveLab. There are a couple of other DAWs that will allow you to do the same kind of technique. I've set my limiter or the level set on the master output. So it's going to apply to everything that's playing out of my track, but I can apply plugins to individual clips and just split the clips. So I've got no EQ in, on this clip, my EQ on that clip, and I can also adjust the gain. Making little changes between sections in mastering is something that doesn't happen all the time, but it does happen sometimes, and it's kind of part of the fun. So what if I turn this down? Maybe half a dB, and that seems to make the difference to me. It feels like it keeps the vocal centered, where the listener, when we get into the loud section, isn't going to have to lean in and actually find the vocal. Just out of curiosity, let's listen to this first section with and without the EQ and see if there's any aspect of it that we might want to keep. No, I, I don't think I like the low frequency roll off. I think I'd like to keep the rich bass there. You know, maybe we can pull out a little bit of the resonant low mid from the voice. And keeping that the top end dips, this seems to smooth out even the verse. So I kind of like that. Maybe I'll give this a name, which is give it time verse. And that way I can just grab that and apply it also to the other verses in the track. So I still got this idea that I could get a slightly smoother sound that will accentuate the presence region in the track. So let me see if there's something I can do to make that happen. There are a couple of couple of thoughts that occur to me. First of all, I've got the tone set, so I don't think I want to do any signal processing before that EQ, but I wonder if I can't apply a little bit of compression after the EQ that I've got going here. <laughs> 
Now, definitely going to use a relatively long release time and a fairly long attack time so that I'm not messing up the strong beats. And I'm, I don't really want much in the way of pumping. I'm going to pull the knee down, and I'm also going to filter the side chain so that the kick drum isn't going to modulate the compression too much. Because again, I want this to kind of be a, a way of smoothing and creating a little more density in the track overall. <laughs> So I applied some compression and I'm playing with the wet dry mix. I like the smoothing, but it feels like it's muddying up the track a little bit. In general, I'm not one that goes for multiband tools reflexively, but this is an instance where I think having slightly different settings for different parts of the spectrum may help me get the result that I want. The first thing I gotta do is be very careful about how I set the crossover point. When you're using a multiband tool, the place where the crossover is set absolutely will result in a slight loss of clarity and fullness in a track. In the case of this track, it might be helpful because there's a little bit of sort of woolen quality down in the in the mud room, around 150 hertz. actually kind of cool. The, the crossover can be problematic. In this case, it's actually being helpful. It's keeping the mid-range clear. The mid-range isn't weighted down by the compression that's happening on the low end. Uh, it's keeping the track pretty articulate. Let me examine whether I can use a little bit of this dynamic range control to further keep the high end in check. She said, give it time, give it time. The cool thing about using high frequency compression in this context is that I can smooth out the top end and then I can use some makeup gain to make sure that I'm not losing energy in that high band. And I kind of like that. It's causing me to think that maybe my EQ is a little bit too strong. When you master a track, when I master tracks, there's an iterative process, especially when you start bringing in multiple tools like an EQ and a compressor and something else. One change with one tool may change the results you got with the other. So you're sort of going back and forth managing the interactions between the tools. Yeah, that actually kind of sounds better. So far, I've got the level where I want it. It's nice and smooth. The track's as dense as I want it to be. Remember early on when I was listening to the track, I was also concerned about the bits of ear candy, right? Those secondary role players that are creating interest in the overall sound. So I'm going to turn this on and off and make sure that I'm not losing the delay throws and some of the other interesting elements in the track. Cool. So from this point forward, it's really about experimentation. There are lots of other things that we could try to do. When you think about controlling the top end, I've already worked with EQ to control the top end. And then I discovered that I could use a, a frequency-specific compressor to address the top end. 
there are many ways to the same goal, and ultimately it's up to you to explore and figure out the one that's going to get you closest to the result that you hear. If you take a look at the drop-down list, there are tools that allow you to, to spread the stereo image, add excitation. It's worth exploring all of them and figuring out what they do so that you have, it's kind of like when you open up a, a toolkit, if you're a carpenter, you know, you have different kinds of screwdrivers to use for different kinds of tasks, know the tools and you know which one to grab to get the best result. There's one other thing I'm interested to try, um, and that is to see if I can't get a little bit of excitation to kind of increase the sense of the, the sort of the presence and the vibe of this track. So I'm going to pull up the exciter. Chances are I will need to implement this as a multiband tool as well, because I really only want to get a little bit of the and the presence and the excitement at the top end. I don't want to muck up the low end. 99.9% .9 of the time I will turn on the oversampling because I'll get a little bit more control and a smoother response out of the saturation. We'll end up with aliasing. Sounds pretty good to me. So now that I've adjusted the chorus, I'm going to play one more time from the verse to the chorus to make sure that I, in, in these uh, new steps that I've applied, I haven't created some problems in the contrast that weren't there before. Cool. It's a nice contrast. It's fun, interesting. If I wanted to go even a little crazier to accentuate the drama built into this arrangement, I could think about adding the imager just to create a little bit wider soundstage in the chorus. Let's see what happens if I do that. You tell me that. So that might be a little bit much, but it's kind of a cool idea. It does mirror a little bit of what mix engineers often think about in creating contrast between verse and chorus, which is to change panning, increase a sense of width and depth. So that's just one more tool in the palette. I could certainly put a fork in this and call it done. Everything that I'm thinking about from this point forward falls into the category of subjective, optional, fun, nice, but I feel like at this point, I've served the song well. I've got it to a point where the level is going to match what's out in the marketplace. And um, I would go ahead and render this out. Like I said, I would split the track so I have copy and paste the same treatments in the choruses and the verses, making sure that the levels are the same across each of them. I would top and tail the track, export it as a WAV file, and then the time comes for delivery. But um, this has given you a bit of a walkthrough around the process of mastering a pop track of a particular kind. Uh, so I hope you found that useful. Have a look at the show notes where you'll find links to other episodes. Other episodes talk about loudness. We talk about EQ and compression and break down some of the basic and essential tools that I've been working with a little bit out of context. And this is much more in context. I hope you found it useful. Thanks for joining me. Give it time, give it time, maybe something different will happen.